Pulling a crime on a colony world should be easy. Less security, less people around, probably relatively inexperienced police. Well, sometimes other factors can play a role. Trouble with Time by Arthur C. Clarke. Read by Carl Wallace. We don't have much crime on Mars, said Detective Inspector Rawlings, a little sadly. In fact, that's the chief reason I'm going back to the yard. If I stay here much longer, I'd get completely out of practice. We're sitting in the main observation lounge of the Phobos spaceport, looking out across the jagged, sun-drenched crags of the tiny moon. The very rocket that had brought us up from Mars had left ten minutes ago, and it was now beginning the long fall back to the ochre-tinted globe hanging there against the stars. In half an hour, we'd be boarding the liner for Earth, a world upon which most of the passengers had never set foot, but which they still called home. And at the same time, continued the inspector, now and then there's a case that makes life interesting. You're an art dealer, Mr. McCarr. I'm sure you've heard about that spot or bother at Meridian City a couple of months ago. I don't think so, replied the plump, olive-skinned little man I'd taken for just another returning tourist. Presumably the inspectors had already checked through the passenger list. I wonder how much he knew about me. I tried to reassure myself that my conscience was, well, reasonably clear. After all, everybody took something out through Martian uh, customs. It's been rather well hush hushed up, said the inspector, but you can't keep these things quiet for long. Anyway, a jewel thief from Earth tried to steal Meridian Museum's greatest treasure, the Siren Goddess. But that's absurd, I objected. It's priceless, of course, but it's only a lump of sandstone. You couldn't sell it to anyone. You might as well try to steal the Mona Lisa. The inspector grinned rather mercilessly. That's happened once, he said. Maybe the motive was the same. Our collectors said we give a fortune for such an object, even if they could, even if they could only look it at themselves. Don't you agree, Mr. McCarr? That's perfectly true. In my business, you meet all sorts of crazy people. Well, this chappy, named Danny Weaver, had been well paid by one of them. If it hadn't been for a piece of fantastically bad luck, he might have brought it off. The spaceport PA system apologized for the further slight delay owing to final fuel checks, and asked for a number of passengers to report to information. While we were waiting for the announcement to finish, I recalled what little I knew about the Siren Goddess. Though I'd never seen the original, like most other departing tourists, I had a replica in uh, my luggage. A board certificate of the Mars Borough of Antiquities, guaranteeing that this full-scale reproduction is an exact copy of the so-called Siren Goddess, discovered in the Mare Serenium by the Third Expedition, A.D. 2012. It was quite a tiny thing to have caused so much uh, controversy, only eight or nine inches high, you wouldn't look at it twice if you saw it in the museum on Earth. The head of a young woman, with slightly oriental features, elongated earlobes, hair curled in tight ringlets close to the scalp, lips half parted on an expression of pleasure or surprise, that's all. Which an enigma so baffling, it's inspired a hundred of, of religious sects and driven quite a few archaeologists round the bend. For a perfectly human head, how in the right was ever to be found on Mars? whose only intelligent inhabitants were, were uh, crustaceans, educated lobsters, as the newspapers are fond of calling them. The aboriginal Martians never came near to achieving spaceflight. In any event, their civilization died before man existed on Earth. No wonder the goddess of the solar system's number one mystery. I don't suppose we'll find the answer in my lifetime, if we ever do. Danny's plan was beautifully simple, considered the inspector, you don't have silly dead in Martian City gets on Sunday, when everything closes down, and the colonists stay home to watch TV from Earth. D Danny was counting on this when he checked in on the hotel in Meridian West late Friday afternoon. It is Saturday for reconnoitering the museum, an undisturbed Sunday for the job itself, and on Monday morning he'd be just another tourist leaving town. Early Saturday he strolled through the little park and crossed over into, into Meridian East, where the museum stands. In case you don't know, the city gets its name because it's exactly on longitude 180 degrees. 
There's a big stone slab on the park with the Prime Meridian engraved on it. So the visitors can keep themselves photographed standing in two uh, in the hemispheres at once. Amazing what simple things amuse some people. Danny spent the day going over the museum, exactly like any other tourist determined to get his money's worth. But at closing time, he didn't leave. He held up one of the galleries not open to the public. When the museum had been arranging a late canal period re reconstruction, but had run out of money before the job could be finished. He stayed there until about midnight, just in case there were any enthusiastic researchers still in the building. Then he emerged and got to work. Wait a minute, I interrupted. What about the night watchman? The inspector laughed. My dear chap, they don't have such luxuries on Mars. There weren't even any alarms, but who would bother to steal lumps of stone? True, the goddess was sealed up neatly in a strong glass and metal cabinet, just in case some souvenir hunter took a fancy to her. But if, even if she were stolen, there was nowhere the thief could hide. And of course, all outgoing traffic would be searched as soon as the statue was missed. That was true enough. I've been thinking in terms of Earth, forgetting that every city on Mars has a closed little world of its own beneath the force field to protect it from the freezing near vacuum. Beyond those electronic shields is the utterly hostile emptiness of the Martian outback, where man will die in seconds without pr protection. That makes law enforcement very easy. No wonder there's so little crime on Mars. Danny had a beautiful set of tools, as specialized as the watchmakers. The main item was a microsaw no bigger than a soldering iron. Had a wafer-thin blade, driven in a million cycles a second by an ultrasonic power pack. It would go through glass or metal like butter, and leave a cut only by the thick as a hair. Which was very important for Danny, since he had to leave no traces of his handiwork. I suppose you've guessed how he intended to operate. He was going to cut through the base of the cabinet and substitute one of those souvenir replicas for the real goddess. It might be a couple of years before some inquisitive expert discovered the awful truth. Long before then, the original would have traveled back to Earth, perfectly disguised as a copy of itself, with a genuine certificate of authenticity. Pretty neat, eh? It must have been a weird business, working in that darkened gallery with all those million year old carvings and unexplainable artifacts around him. A museum on Earth is b bad enough at night, but at least it's, well, human. And Gallery 3, which hosts, houses the goddess, is particularly unsettling. It's full of bastardly, showing quite incredible animals uh, fighting each other. They look rather like giant beetles, and most paleontologists fight from the head they could ever have existed. But imaginary or not, they belong to this world. And it didn't disturb Danny as much as the goddess, staring him across the ages and defying him to explain her presence here. She gave him the creeps. How do I know? He told me. Then he set to work on that cabinet as carefully as any diamond cutter preparing to cleave a gem. It took most of the night to slice out the trap door. It was nearly dawn when he relaxed and put down the saw. There was still a lot of work to do, but the hardest part was over. Put the replica into the case, checking its appearance against the photos he thought we had brought with him, covering up his chases might take most of Sunday, but that worry didn't worry him in the least. Had another 24 hours, and would possibly be wel welcome Monday's first visitors so he could mingle with him and make his inconspicuous uh, exit. It was a perfectly horrible shock to his nervous system, therefore, when the main doors were noisily unbarred at 8.30, and the museum staff, all six of them, started to open up f f for the day. Danny bolted for the emergency exit, leaving everything behind. Tools, goddesses, the lot. He had a big surprise when he found himself on the street. She would be completely deserted at this time of day, with everything at home, reading the... Uh, Sunday papers. But there was the citizens of Meridian East as large as life, heading for plant or office in what was obviously a normal uh, working day. By the time poor Danny got back to us to tell if we were waiting for him, we couldn't wait, claim much credit for deducing that only visitors from Earth, and a very recent one at that, could have overlooked Meridian City's chief claim to fame. And I presume you know what that is? Frankly, I don't, I answered. You can't see much of Mars in six weeks, and I never went east of the Surgeon's Major. Well, it's absurdly simple. We shouldn't be too hard on Danny. Even the locals occasionally fall into the same trap. Something that doesn't bother us on the Earth, where we're freely able to dump the problem in the Pacific Ocean. But Mars, of course, is all dry land. And it means that somebody has to live with the international dateline. 
Danny, you see, had worked for Meridian West. It was Sunday over there, all right. It was still Sunday when we picked him up back at the hotel. But over in Meridian East, half a mile away, it was always Saturday. That little trip across the park had made all the difference. I told you it was rotten luck. There was a long moment of silent sympathy, then I asked, Where did you get? Three years, said the inspector. That doesn't seem very much. Mars years. It makes it almost six of ours. And a whacking fine, which, by an occupation, came to just the refund value of his return ticket to Earth. He isn't in jail, of course. Mars can't afford that kind of non-productive uh, luxury. Then he has to work for a living under discreet surveillance. I told you the museum doesn't have a, that, a night watchman. What well, has one now? Guess who? All passengers prefer to board in 10 minutes. Please collect your hand luggage, ordered the loudspeakers. As they started to move towards the airlock, I couldn't help asking one more question. What about the people who put, put Danny up to it? There must have been a lot of money behind him. Did you get them? Not yet. They covered their tracks pretty thoroughly. I believe Danny was telling the truth when he said he couldn't give us any leads. Still, it's not my case, as I told you. Going back to my old job at the yard. But the policeman always keeps his eye open. Like an art dealer. A eh, Mr. McCarr? Why, you look a bit green about the gills. Have one of my space sickness tablets. No, thank you, answered Mr. McCarr. I'm quite all right. His tone was distinctly unfriendly. The social temperature seemed to have dropped below zero in the past few minutes. I looked at Mr. McCarr and I looked at the inspector. And suddenly I realized we were going to have a very interesting trip. The end. <laughs>